who's really behind terrorism. And why the revolution will not be televised. We still do not know who did this or why. And people shouldn't jump to conclusions before we have all the facts. But make no mistake, we will get to the bottom of this. And we will find out who did this. We'll find out why they did this. Any, respons uh, any responsible individuals, uh, any responsible groups will feel the full weight of justice. The dramatic scene played out in front of our cameras. Parents grabbing their children and running after spending the night hunkering in their houses and then finding themselves face to face with the muzzle of a SWAT officer's rifle. It's a little stressful. It was a little stressful seeing these guys uh, pointing big guns and you're holding your daughter in your arms. Each time the SWAT team would rescue a family at the point of a gun, they would rush into the home in an armored line, guns at the ready in case the suspect was hiding inside. And each time they cleared out a resident, they did it with a force that reflected the uncertainty of not knowing who was a friend and who was a foe. You know, he banged on the door. I looked up. I was shocked. And there was a gun or two <laughs> guns or whatever pointing down at me and the guys. And they said, get out, get out. I said, okay. And I wanted to know, uh, you know, do I get my shoes? Or just get out, get out, okay, all right. Okay. The pattern was dramatically repeated time and again, house after house. But finally, it became apparent all the families were out of their homes and the suspect was not inside. It was terrifying. About an hour later, though, the drama picked up suddenly again as officers rushed to a house in what had previously been a safe area. They broke down one door and then took the people cowering in the house next door out with their hands on their heads. If this does turn out to be a terrorism, don't immediately jump to conclusions about uh, who's responsible. There's some... It, it's more than rumor, it, it's chatter from within the intelligence services that suggests that it, it might not be what one's mind perhaps leaps to of uh, uh, Islamic radicals, but that it could be uh, homegrown extremists uh, uh, who, of course, uh, have attacked it in the past in, within America. Patriot Day, which is today, the first uh, Monday in, in April, so that might have a, a special significance. Uh, and, and we know that the uh, Homeland Security have, uh, ever since President Obama was elected, been on potential alert for an incident that came from, from the right. A person of interest, a white man said to be in his 40s. Do you know this man? A surveillance video shows a middle-aged white man changing his shirt just about a half block from where the SUV was abandoned. The possible suspect described as a white male appearing to be in his mid-40s. This person of interest, they say, who's a white man in his 40s, they think, who is seen not far from the vehicle changing shirts. The guy in the video seen here is described as a white male in his 40s. He's seen stopping to take off a sweatshirt. The NYPD is now searching for somebody they describe to be a white male believed to be in his 40s. They all yesterday said it was a white man. There was Bloomberg saying it was a deranged man with a political agenda. Not one of them would say if it was a Muslim. Not one of them would say if it was a Middle Easterner. Not one of them, if it hit them in the face, would acknowledge what's going on around them, which is why we must defend ourselves. We have a bunch of overly race-conscious government dupes running everything in this country. There were the news anchors and the reporters, you heard it with your own ears just yesterday, repeating white male, 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 white male. You haven't heard Muslim male, 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 did you? If they found out who it was, the guy gave himself up, and they won't say Muslim male, Muslim male, links to Islam, Islam, Muslim, Muslim, Islam, Islam, Muslim. Why won't they say it? Because they're a bunch of morons, and that's why we're in trouble. You heard it with your own damn ears. What more do I have to say to you? In fact, if you listened to the news conference, it was revealed that this bastard, when he returned from Pakistan the last time, this bastard underwent some kind of secondary screening after he returned to the U.S. And that now somehow led to his arrest. So you have to ask yourself, why was he screened when he came back the last time? And what was learned 
And why did Napolitano not arrest him? This is the fourth time she has failed us. This is the fourth time she has shown her incompetence. This is the fourth time we've seen that it's an ordinary citizen who protected us, not these overpaid oafs in the government. The only reason the bomb didn't go off is because this bastard didn't know how to make a bomb properly. Who in the media seemed most disappointed today that the bomber turned out not to be a white man after he was identified as a Muslim from Pakistan? Who in the media seemed most boohooish that the bomber wasn't another Timothy McVeigh or he didn't match the protocols of the uh, militia up in, uh, in Michigan? Bloomberg, the moron mayor of New York, proved that not only that a billionaire can not only be a criminal like Madoff, but a billionaire can also be a moron like Bloomberg. It just shows you you don't have to be smart or intelligent to be a billionaire. Yesterday he was saying it was a homegrown terrorist who was disgruntled. Now it gets worse. Wait, it gets worse. CNN, the seditious news agency, actually put out a piece where they felt bad for the bomber because his house had been foreclosed. Firm that his house was foreclosed on uh, in recent years, I mean, one would have to imagine that that brought a lot of pressure and a lot of, of heartache on that family. Yeah, she said July of 2009 they left, and then shortly after that she says they changed the locks uh, on the home. But wait, there's more. There's a show on Fox News. He has a schmuck on named Bob Beckel, who yesterday said this on Wallbanger show on Fox. They have a, a person of interest as a naturalized American citizen returned to the country after spending several months in Pakistan. Is it is it too early to read into that? No, I I, I, I still think the jury is out on this. I, I think it could be a, a right wing militiaman uh, in, involved in this. I mean, you never know. Now, why would Hannity permit this man to ever come back on his show again? The answer is because they're both clowns. But they're not the problem. They're part of the government media problem that we all have. When you've got an agency like Fox, which is so important to us, that has now become the CNN of five years ago, and we no longer have a truly conservative media outlet, except for a few people left in talk radio, tell me where we're going to be tomorrow if this goes on. How many different times do I have to say it? How many times do we have to put up with this garbage? Law enforcement officials don't know who left the Nissan Pathfinder behind, but at this point, the mayor believes the suspect acted alone. If I had to guess 25 cents, this would be exactly that. Somebody a who's homegrown. homegrown, maybe a mentally deranged person or somebody with a political agenda that doesn't like uh, the health care bill or something. It could be anything. Here's Tim Clemente, the FBI counterterrorism official, admitting, but like it's, you know, just, oh, we listened to all the phone calls. Well, this has already been admitted, but it just shows how illegal all this is. This is an illegitimate government. Here it is on CNN. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the phone call between Catherine Russell and her husband, Tamlin Sarnayev. You said something very interesting on Aaron Burnett's show last night. You said that if Catherine Russell does not divulge the contents of this phone call, that the FBI had other methods finding out what was said. What did you mean by that? Well, on the national security uh, side of the House, for in, the, in the federal government, you know, we have assets. There's lots of assets at our disposal throughout the intelligence community, and also not just domestically but overseas. Those assets are, allow us to gain information and intelligence on things that we can't use ordinarily in a criminal investigation but are used for major terrorism investigations or counterintelligence investigations. And you're not talking that about a voicemail, right? What are you talking about exactly? I'm talking about all digital communications are, are um, there, there's a way to, to look at digital communications in the past. Um, and I can't go into detail of how that's done or what's done, but I can tell you that no digital communication is secure. And so these communications will be found out. They will, the conversation will be known. It's all recorded. It's just a question of whether or not Catherine Russell decides to uh, that's enough. own up to Everything what said, is recorded since the mid-1990s with your tax money. And the people listening like Seabell Edmonds, she hears them commanding Al-Qaeda, running white slave rings, uh, running weapons, just like they run Al-Qaeda now. I'm going to explain to you, the people that run our government, that arrogant FBI guy all smiling, <laughs> we have assets. Yeah, we know you got assets, pal. We know all about them. And now you have people without counsel say they did it while they're sedated and you cut their throat out. I mean, these guys are creepy, man. This is mafia that's broken this country's back. They get hundreds of billions every few years and no-bid contracts to spy on us.
and they all go along with it, and they all think it's funny. They go, trust us. Yeah, right. You stole on the country blind. And Tim, is there any way, now, I guess it was a voicemail, they could, they could try to get the, the phone companies to get that up at this point, but if it's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually can find out what happened, right, unless she tells them. No, there is a way. They, we certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. Um, it's not necessarily something that the FBI is going to want to present in court, but it may help lead the investigation and or lead the questioning of her. So, so we can certainly being find that out. Or they can actually get that. Because people we, we were saying, look, well, that wouldn't be possible. It's pretty incredible what you're saying. No, welcome, welcome to America. The, uh, the, all of that stuff is being captured as we speak, whether we know it or like it or not. Note to self, as Ted exactly. Ferrick just said here, yeah. All right, thanks very much to, to both of you. Obviously, that, that right there, a very significant thing. Because people have been saying, well, there's a conversation. If it wasn't a voicemail, they don't know. If they can find out, that could obviously become crucial. Now, recently, Ron Paul was on the Alex Jones Show, and he expressed concern about the way the police conducted themselves. He had some pretty strong language. He called it martial law, and we agree. Governments are supposed to protect our liberties. Once they decide they're going to make us safe, economically and physically safe, uh, they can only do this by taking away our liberties. Those pictures really concern me. That is such a visual image when you see thousands and thousands of troops, and they weren't your local friendly policemen that were involved. I mean, can you imagine all these people being lost? They became prisoners. It was uh, accepted too easily. It was uh, martial law. But Lawrence O'Donnell took exception to that. And he very strongly called Ron Paul a liar repeatedly on his show for what he said about the way the police conducted themselves, going house to house, pointing guns at people in windows and houses, dragging them out of their houses at gunpoint, uh, going down the streets in armored personnel carriers with full police uh, riot gear. Wait, I want to show pictures okay. first. Okay. And then I want to show some of the pictures of the Boston police, okay? Look at this. I mean, if, if this is what you have, why don't you invade a country? <laughs> Show some of the other ones. I mean, go up to Canada, take their oil. Uh, <laughs> look at these. These are half tracks. These, I don't care what you, you might want to call it an urban assault vehicle, but w this country is becoming a police state, and it is very troubling to me. We believe that's very excessive. We believe that that is setting a template for martial law to be gradually eased in, and so does Ron Paul. But Lawrence O'Donnell called him a liar. He said from the very beginning to say that this was forced is a lie, that the governor was just simply telling people to shelter in place, and it was a suggestion. Police don't need warrants. Families thrown out of their homes at gunpoint to be searched without probable cause. No guns were pointed at any families. What a vile lie. There were no tanks and there were no police pointing their weapons at innocent citizens. Well, when the government points a gun at you and suggests that you do something, we call that force. And they may call it something else, but they're just playing with semantics. We wanted to add to the pictures that people have already seen, pictures that were already there when Lawrence O'Donnell called Ron Paul a liar. So we sent Dan Bedondi to interview residents and tell us what they experienced during this excessive manhunt. And here are those interviews. A cop pointed his gun at me, and then they called SWAT in, and then SWAT came and picked me up by a shield, and they threw me in the back of a car and then dropped me off in the middle of Newton. So they dropped you off in the middle of nowhere, and what time of night was that? Uh, what time was that? Like, 5? Yeah. Broad daylight. He just dropped me off, took me out of the cuffs, and told me to walk. And when they uh, put the cuffs on you, did they read you your Miranda rights? Nope. So you were unlawfully detained from being on public property? Yeah. Did they ask to search your house? Um, they told me they wouldn't have searched the house. So they didn't ask you, they just told you? They told me they weren't coming in to search. And uh, did they command you to leave your home? They told us we had to leave, yes. One thing I was very, very upset about is that when we were leaving here, all my the lights were on in the house, TVs, you know, and um, back door, they had gone the back door down my basement, and they told me, I said, let me just close all my doors and lock up, and they said, no, they would do it. I came home. Back door was open. This is hours now later. Back door was open, front door was open, basement door was open, lights were on, TVs were on. 
No one did anything. So they basically left your house unsecured with the doors wide open where nobody was home? Yes, they did. And you say there's bullet holes in your car here? Yes, this is a bullet hole here. Um, Are they going to try to that quick? And there's a bullet hole here. I shot out the window on the side there. And in my car, there's a bullet hole, as you can see. I don't know where it is. Maybe it's in the car somewhere. I have no <laughs> idea. But the back window's blown out and the side window's blown wow. out. What they did, they disrupted this in entire world for a day. We are initially got a report from the police department that it was voluntary searches, but then after talking to the residents, uh, we found out that they weren't asking if, if they could have permission to enter homes. They were just forcefully entering people's homes uh, to search. So did they knock at your door just walk in? They knocked the door, but you know what I mean, the door, they almost, they, they almost Push the door through them. Okay, and uh, did they ask you to search your home at all, or they just did it? They just did it. You know, they just came in and uh, they went through. And uh, did they command you to leave your home? Yes. Uh, we left, and they say, let's lock the doors. They say, no, no, we'll take care of it. We we'll lock your doors and everything. We came home midnight, and everything was open, and nobody was around here. So they left your house also unsecured and wide open. Exactly. And nobody was around here. What takes anybody? Anybody can walk in. They mistreated the elderly then, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Unbelievable. yes, you know, I didn't like that. You know, like I said, they tried to do the job, you know what I mean? No. But uh, on this point here, I got very upset, very upset. And, uh, did they ask to search your house or they just searched it? Um, they wanted to search the house, but my grandma said nobody was in there. And then they proceeded to ask my grandma for my my uncle lives upstairs and the house is a deadbolt and my grandma said you know there's no one up there I didn't hear anyone go up the stairs but they still made her give the house key and unlocked it with that key and searched upstairs and all the way up to the attic. Well they they um, didn't want to give the key back but they ended up giving the key back my grandma they did. And did they command you at all any time to leave your home or stay in the home? Uh, so it was stay inside but the thing overall that cut, caught my eye is that my friend on Franklin Street um, lived across the street and the army people did a huge search in their garage um, but the, the, the boat was directly across the street they didn't search the boat not once they didn't even go around it that's, that's where the younger brother was found that's where the suspect was and it's funny because the police didn't find him when they did the thing the person finally got to leave their house because they said everyone stay inside he left his house and saw the blood on the boat we you know had to go through multiple checkpoints and we were searched ourselves other journalists on the scene were told to lay on the ground as they were searched so it was a very very touchy very um, intense situation to be in matter of fact the one we woke up a big shootout that was done from over here and over it was look like a Vietnam song. And the, those guns that were going left and right. Yeah, all your neighbors' houses got hit. Oh, we did do the door. Too. We got a stone door broke. They passed my stone and door. And the other door is And the door oh, going oh, upstairs, yeah. There was a block in there. Nice but they would put some so, more feet on this side. Yeah. They would have me in my bedroom. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Nice when you're sleeping, too. Yeah. <laughs> were guns pointing at you any time, and did they tell you to put your hands up in the air or anything? Not me, but my boyfriend. So your boyfriend had his hands up in the air and they were searching him? Yes, because he came out to check his diesel in the back of his truck. They were pretty much right here in front of my house and they were just shooting down that direction. Um, that went on for a couple minutes and then there were there were two more booms with the last one just really lighting the entire neighborhood up. Um, it yeah. shook the house, set off all the car alarms. And uh, did they make you put your hands up? Um, when we when we came out, we put our hands up and they searched us. But other than that, we just walked down. The and did they ask you at all to search you? Um, yeah, they, they asked, they just, well, they told us that they were going to be searching us. And so they're saying, oh, everyone uh, let us do this. And that's the type of emails and texts and things that I've been uh, seeing people saying out there. In fact, um, here's one from YouTube today. Are you serious? They are looking for a test. In fact, you guys can even give me a document cam shot of this. I'll show the viewers. Are you serious? They are looking for a terrorist. What and how should they handle this? Let's explain for the something billionth times to the billions of people the importance. People are not special. Get the F out of the way as professionals are trying to make things safe. You, you know this guy's a cop.
They may not be nice teddy bears doing booty, but they are doing it. And then you go to the guy's channel. He's into superhero movies and cop movies, and he talks about how epic the new Superman is. Uh, here's his channel, Will Cass. Or he's a contractor for government. I mean, I've seen this a million times. Man of Steel, emotionally epic. <laughs> this is a child. The globalists have written books about it. They think you're stupid. Now, they've never done this in American policing or any other policing, lockdown, most of a city. And, and I saw them on the news going, everyone could be a suspect. They could have people aiding them. And a blonde-haired woman comes out of her house with her hands up. After she gets in the, off, the, off the step, she puts her hands down. And the cop goes and shoves her and goes, put them up! I mean, it is a bunch of nobodies on a power trip. Most police I know in cities would not act like that. Now, if you look like, I mean, it's like the cops in L.A. shooting up women in cars that weren't even the same car as, the, as Dorner. <clears throat> they're not out there facing real terrorists. The real thing they're facing is, da is dangerous automobile wrecks and, and, and some criminals. And it's just this whole, we're soldiers, we're supermen, we're fighting this thing. And, and you notice in this guy's uh, comment, and there's a lot of these, are, they, are you serious? They are looking for a terrorist. The guy's automatically a terrorist because USA Today said he is a terrorist this weekend. No judge, no jury. He's sedated. Who even knows if he's alive? And uh, they're telling us, oh, he, he, I mean, they could grab me and say, I, I, I confessed. What and how should they handle this? Let me explain for the 9472347288. I mean, just, you know, it's like a billion times to the billions of people, the importance. People are not special. Get the F out of the way as professionals are trying to make things safe. See, we're not special. He is. This person probably is a janitor. Nothing against being a janitor. It's very honest work, but a janitor at a police department. And, like, goes in and has coffee. He's part of the team. The you are not special. Government is special. Government is authority. Government is official. USA. USA, uh, yeah, I got a 75 IQ. The Iron Man, he fights the, the terrorists. I was at Barton Springs yesterday laying there drying off after a swim a mile. And it's not even a lot. I'm trying to swim two miles next time I go. I'm so out of shape. And I'm sitting there, and I just listen to all the adult men around me going, yeah, he's got the thruster power. That's how he deals with it. Uh-huh. And their kids are talking about Iron Man. He's like, yeah, I like how he dealt with that one terrorist. Yeah, yeah, of course, the terrorist. <laughs> that is what men do. I mean, I've sat there watching the Avengers, and the men will sit there in the uh, theater before it's going on going, man, this means so much to me to get to see this. This is so, that's your manhood, a flying aircraft carrier? It ain't real. You and your family are being injected with soft kill, delayed kill, and binary bio weapons on record. Eco-science, find out science are, read it. Bioweapons are being injected into you. You want to be a superhero? The New World Order's here right now. People are preparing for an armed march on D.C. That they are the terrorists that Washington, D.C. is the good guys. Washington, D.C. might as well be the floating fortress of doom or the, or the, the black pyramid orbiting the Earth that the stinking aliens are in for all that matters. I mean, it, it's worse because it's our own species, and it's hard to get people. But the, uh, the, 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 the White House was attacked, and Olympus has fallen, so that's why they can't have tours no more, because the terrorists might try something. The criminals have committed so many crimes in government that now the sky is the limit. They intend to go all the way. I love this. People are not special. Get the F out of the way as professionals are trying to make things safe. They may not be nice teddy bears doing that, but they are doing it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh, I mean, look at this. People are not special. Get the F out of the way. So your wife comes out, blonde head lady. Uh, the cops shoved her. Just keep hands up, bitch. That good. You're not special. Uh, respect me. Respect me. 
And we talked to the people. You'd have like a 17-year-old out in their yard look nothing like the guy. They pull you up, strip you down, drive you around, throw you out in another city. Uh, get out of the car. We the government, you not. <laughs> Never forget the video of the state police from our own squad car. 2001, Abby Martin, no, 2002. Maybe veteran, no criminal record. A checkpoint. They're searching cars. She goes, were you looking for somebody? No, it's a routine check. Oh, it's routine, so it's okay. It's like, we're going to stick you in a blender. It's routine, so it's all right. She goes, well, you can't search my car. And they go, get out of the car, then. I mean, their voice was actually like, all right, get out of the car. I'm handcuffing you. And then they get in the back of the car, and they find a pocket constitution, and they start going, he's a look at this. I've never seen nothing like it. It's like the most unintentional comedy in the world. It'd be like if they found a daisy in a field and went, oh, he's so scary. What are we going to do? And they're going, I think she, we need to arrest her for this. I don't think this is legal. And the head one goes, I think it might be. That may have been what she's talking about, having rights. I mean, it's literally, you know what? I'm going to say this. Mike Judge sends me text saying, hey, good show today, good this and that. And then I'm, he's like, oh, come on, soon as a couple of weeks. Mike Judge, you need to come on, man, because idiocracy that you made is exactly where we're already at. Of course, I don't call him that often. I just got to bug the hell out of him until he does it. Now, if I want to go listen to Weldon Henson play music and drink beer with Mike Judge, I guess I can get that done. But see, Mike, I admire you. I want to get you on air. I don't want to go to a honky-tonk and drink beer with Weldon Henson, even though I love his country music. Because then I got to drive home. I'm joking. I went out and saw Weldon a couple weeks ago. It's always good to see his wife, too. What a sweetie. Water is for toilets. Drink Rondo, the thirst mutilator. And President Macho Camacho. The Dominator Annihilator Monster Truck. Oh, God, help me. We're going to go to break and come back with your calls. I don't even know what to do anymore. I have entered the Twilight Zone. Because that's what I see, like, you little people need to get out of the way and let the professionals handle it. The professionals never locked down, you know, 80% of a city and came up pointing guns at women and children. And, oh, oh, and, and then families are walking out there pointing it right at them. Like, like, and, and you see the cops' eyes. They're all, like, on power trips and, and, and like, look all crazy. You see looks of cops going, like, and it's like getting all into the pageantry and the media and their movie stars. I mean, it is mentally ill narcissism. And they'd come up to like AP reporters and say, we will kill you if you don't, if you don't stop filming. Because folks, they were given the word, this will bring everybody down. These guys have got to die. Got to kill the patsies. We shot into that boat with all those machine guns and he's not dead. He's, oh my God, the media's on it. We can't kill him. I was listening to the scanner. Oh my gosh, the media's on it. Abort, abort. Then all of a sudden the guy gets up. It's all right. Bring him into custody and cut his larynx out. He'll confess. <laughs> Before and during this race, there's bomb drills for the first time. Scores of private security contractors wired to command centers. Yet it's the first time there's been an explosion. The witness was shocked at FBI denying a bomb threat or even that a drill took place oh when it was regularly being announced on the loudspeakers. There was um, police spotters. Or uh, there was people on the roof with, with binoculars looking down onto the athlete's village at the start. There was dogs with their handlers going around sniffing for explosives. And, and we were told on a um, loud announcement that we shouldn't be concerned if this was just a drill. Every false flag in recent memory has been accompanied by a staged drill. In the middle of the drill, an actual bombing or other attack is carried out. The Justice Department admits terrorists and victims are played by volunteers and actors. The format is highly effective because patsies who are going to be blamed are simply told you're participating in a drill. Before the blast, authorities warn of a controlled explosion near the finish line. Standing by the finish line, but leaving just before the explosion, professional killers Craft International, wired up to FBI command. On their caps front and back, Craft's logo and slogan, violence does solve problems. 
after the explosion, the Croft backpack is missing. It looks identical to the exploded one down to the white square on top. The suspect's ones aren't even the same colours. Here's the city commissioner calling Zarnayev's actors before correcting himself. We're confident that these were the two actors, these were the two individuals that were carrying out uh, this mission. Intelligence author James Fetzer calls this the most amateurish false flag. The official suspect's shot given to media, hundreds of readers note, is horrendously photoshopped. A leg with no body, a ghost in the background, and many other discrepancies. They also note this is how Patsy's right. This will be the last message before the police get me. I never done it. They set me up. Father, please forgive me. I am sorry it has come to this. The FBI says the boy ran over his brother, but witnesses confirm this is him being escorted by police and the chilling sight witnesses saw next. We saw the first suspect get hit by a police SUV, and then after he was hit, shot multiple times. Politicians and media are already using the incident to call for more interference from Chechnya to the Middle East. Let's speak to James Corbett of the Corbett Report. Thanks for coming on. In whose interest is another invasion? Certainly, this is not, I think, in the interest of the American people. Is it in the interest of the, the political class that, that uh, as we say, benefits from these types of attacks and uh, gets them to extend their, their powers and authorities over their own citizens and the excuse to go into the Caucasus region? Absolutely. It's almost impossible to find a military uh, engagement that America has been involved in since that time that it ha hasn't in some way provocateured or used false pretexts to get the American public on board with. So I think we have to be extremely wary of these types of incidents, especially when they're used as a political uh, a political rallying cry. Um, just as the USS Maine was, they had the, uh, the re remember the Maine uh, to hell with Spain. And I think um, I, I would be very surprised if there weren't people in the Pentagon working on uh, words to rhyme with Chechnya. An investigation finds the FBI practically behind every so-called terrorist plot in the United States. Agents find someone poor enough to bribe and set the plot up for them from start to finish. In one case, the judge said... What occurred here is that a government created acts of terrorism out of a man's bravado and then made those fantasies come true. I suspect that real terrorists would not have bothered themselves with a person who was so utterly inept. Here's the FBI praised for stopping what it says was full ground war against the United States. Unfortunately, because of the fine work of law enforcement, these men were unable to advance their deadly plot. man to have any actual contact with any members of al-Qaeda that you know of? Any... Yeah. The, the, answer that, the answer to that is no. Now, this plot, did you find any explosives, weapons? No, and, and, you, and you raise a, a good point. Let's talk to Dr. Kevin Barrett, author of Questioning the War on Terror. Thanks a lot for joining us. How does the system work? The FBI approaches gullible and sometimes even mentally retarded or homeless people on the fringes of the Islamic community and gives them uh, a plot and says, hey, we're going to try to, you know, and once they approach these homeless people in Florida and said, we want to blow up the Sears Tower, could you help us? Here's $50,000 to go buy boots. And naturally, these homeless people accepted $50,000 to go buy boots, and so they were arrested for terrorism. They do need to kill a few people every now and then to keep the war on terror going, to keep their budgets flowing. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it would be a mistake uh, when some of this live ammunition that the FBI regularly gives happens to go off. Of course, all terrorists are Muslims, except the 94% who aren't. Most terrorism in the States is actually white extremists and, above all, freedom fighters in Puerto Rico, colonized after the USSS main false flag. The reason you never hear about them is media has been told not to report it or the other bigger causes of death. The National Safety Council points out even bee stings or slipping in the bathtub are more deadly. Yet five trillion dollars is being spent in the so-called war on terror against Muslims, killing thousands of soldiers. Dr. Barrett, is there a better way to spend that five trillion? Well, sure, of course. I mean, you know, you're much more likely as an American to die in your bathtub from drowning or to be hit by lightning than to be killed by terrorists. So if they really cared about your life, they would declare a war on bathtub. We lose a 9-11's worth of people uh, from tobacco every two to three days here in the U.S. And we lose a 9-11's worth of people from automobile accidents uh, every 28 days. So 
I mean, these are the real threats to life and limb. All terrorism is not even a statistically significant threat. And Muslims commit 6% of the terrorism in the U.S. Uh, extremist Jews commit 7%. So actually, Jewish extremists are ahead of Muslims in terrorism here. But you never read about that in the newspapers, because guess who owns the newspapers? <laughs> yeah, why are false flags so effective? Uh, humans don't, mostly don't want to uh, engage in aggression against other humans. I mean, just as, as dogs will stop uh, uh, attacking another dog if that dog gives a sign of surrender, uh, humans are wired to fight viciously in their own defense, in the defense of their families and their communities, but not to go out and fight equally viciously in an aggressive raid. For that reason, unscrupulous rulers who want to convince their people to engage in aggression need to convince their people that they are the ones who are under attack. Under attack, Americans are by troops. The Pentagon has suspended America's historic posse comitatus law, which banned troops being used against US civilians. Tanks are for the first time on the streets of America, and Black Hawks with Hellfire laser guided missiles on lawns. Citizens forced out their homes by soldiers, but wall to wall troops didn't find the suspect. Man went out to smoke and accidentally found him in the garden. But drones over Boston are now a great idea, says Police Commissioner Ed Davis. Former Marine Corps Officer Professor James Fetzler, thanks a lot for joining us. What do you make of all this? The use of the military and uh, a martial law version on a city historically known for its liberalism where the vision of uh, military forces going door to door without warrants of these uh, weapons uh, and, and vehicles in the streets of Boston, that was one of its major objectives, and it bodes very ill for the future. Just as people were being forced out their homes, the House was ripping up the Fourth Amendment. The rush through CISPA bill now permits invasion of privacy without warrant. Departing Congressman Ron Paul. Big Brother writ large, cutting the resources of private industry to work for the nefarious purpose of spying on the American people. And that was the plan all along, says the leak on the day of the drill. Warning, laws being written to screw you. I work on a security commission. They're going to pin this event on a male late teens to early 20s. They're going to say he used powder for the explosion and it shouldn't be for sale. They won't find the suspect till later this week, and the raid is issued to occur on Friday. This was a staged event. The event was planned. On Friday, the raid occurred as predicted, and that same day, the Senate brought in legislation to regulate gunpowder. Let's speak to StoryLeaks' Anthony Gucciardi. You've interviewed witnesses and military intel about this. What do you think of the moves? The major explosive materials are common. I mean, you can explode flour if you want to. You can ex explode pretty much anything and make it a weapon. We've seen that before. But yeah, they're using it to go after this agenda to restrict certain freedoms. I mean, let's, let's put it like this. I'm not a super gun crazy guy, no no question. But if they're, they manage to take away the second amendment, then they can take away the first amendment as well, which is freedom of speech. And they can take away the fourth amendment and no one's talking about them. It's a complete media blackout. People say they're more afraid of the government after this attack than terrorists. Millions have gone online angry over the military precedent. Look, they're everywhere. Look up the street, they're like, whoa, whoa. There too. Jesus. The mainstream networks aren't allowing a single discussion of troops rifling through homes, preparation for new wars, and martial law in America. Did you tell us what happened? You actually heard the uh, gunshots Thursday night with this so called gun battle, which now seems like it was probably one sided and uh, only one side was firing shots. Well, when it initially happened, let me just start off by saying as soon as the Boston bombing occurred, I knew somehow it was going to come to my neighborhood. I just had a gut instinct. I had a gut intuition, okay? Uh, the night it happened, it was Thursday night, and I was talking with my wife, and I hear, I, I heard gunshots. My wife thought they were firecrackers, but I'm like, no, honey, I'm, I come from a, a relatively, you know, a gun-loving area, so... Those were gunshots for sure. And I went outside and uh, I thought, holy crap, dude, there is a serious uh, situation happening. But as it continued uh, and it became more aggressive, and I'm talking lots 
of bullets were happening. And then you hear explosion, one, not too big. So maybe that was a firecracker. Explosion two, big. And then explosion three, huge. And you're like, okay, whoa, this is obviously going to be related to the Boston Marathon somehow. This is running through my head. They're going to pull up a police state. I, I just, I know it all is going to happen. So I'm like, great. My whole weekend is ruined. That's, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Okay. So that, that was the beginning. That was Thursday night. Uh, progressing into Thursday night, uh, FBI did show up. Uh, within several seconds of the actual uh, alleged crime happening, uh, there was at least 20 police cars coming in. Within minutes, they were just zoom, 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 zoom. Uh, so many, okay? Well, how many streets over was this from you? This, this didn't seem like it was right. It wasn't on your street, though, right? It was uh, roughly two blocks away. Okay. Okay. Um, so close enough, but I didn't actually see it with my own eyes, but I right. felt everything. Um, what what uh, progressed into the night was uh, basically knowing that uh, something huge had occurred. I was scared. It felt like uh, I was in the diary of Anne Frank for a moment, okay? Because, yes, it was called a lockdown, and, yes, you had to stay inside your homes, and, yes, you were fearful of something going on, going on outside. Okay, uh, let, I mean, let me I, stop you real quick. How did you get that information that it was a lockdown? Did it break in over the radio? Did it come through the TV? How did, how did you receive that info? We had, it was coming in through the internet, which is where we predominantly get all of our information. Okay. And let me, let me tell you what else happened. The first report that I had heard, actually, which I have not found on the internet since, was that it was a controlled explosion by the police. Ah, that night. That was the first report that I had heard that okay. night. And so my instinct was thinking, this is fishy, obviously. This is the same cabal uh, coming to my neighborhood. And because of that, I was mortified because I know how these people are. I know how they act. And I knew that this was going to be a, a horrific experience for me. Okay. Um, so that was my initial feeling. Uh, like I said, it felt like Nazi Germany and Frank, we had to be fearful of looking outside. This is Thursday night. Um, that night, this is something else which I find greatly disturbing and I haven't had too much uh, chance to talk about. I saw a suspect in custody, and uh, he looked exactly like this guy who they have now identified as Sunlil Trafali. Okay. It looked exactly like him, and they had him in custody. All right, they had him in custody behind my house, and I wanted to take pictures, but I was I was honestly too afraid to use my camera. Uh, that's why I didn't actually take any uh, visual photography during the alleged crime. And, and he was the man who was missing, and then later uh, people assumed he might have been the bomber uh, on online because he he had been missing for a while, and then they found him dead in a river. As soon as I had heard that they had found him dead, um, I mean, at this point, I'm not surprised, but. To, to think that that was happening so close to me it just adds to, to, the, to the terror of what was happening because, I mean, I hope the audience understands here that the severity of the, uh, and I'm going to have to use the words inside job that's taking place, and uh, false flag because it is, it's gone so far that it's wreaked havoc into, uh, well, my life personally. I'm not going to say that that, I didn't deserve it or anything because, you know, I don't know, maybe I needed to experience this. But uh, this, is, this is a very big deal. The level, the level of manipulation and lies which are coming forth. And this is just the beginning of my story. Right. Hey, let me go back. One, one more detail. When you saw, uh, or when you think you saw uh, Sun Leo uh, Tripali, was this near your house, behind your house? What are the okay, details I, of that? All right. This, I saw him behind my house they uh, the on thursday night the original it's like they had their headquarters i think it was i think dexter avenue is what it's called no uh, anyway it's, it's a street adjunct to dexter and it is behind my house and they, they kind of had their headquarters there and they had this guy in custody and it just seemed so strange to me what he was doing there because obviously he was in custody to me and he looked just he looked like the exact same guy i don't know what much else to say about this because it's my personal witness testimony and it is just from my own eyes and and that that's it really right okay we'll go ahead and continue uh keep going with the rest of thursday night going into friday all right 
Uh, Thursday night uh, comes to a slow close because of the fact that I saw the suspect, who I had no idea was going to be connected to this some little Trafali character later on. Um, I assumed it was over. Okay, I thought they got the guy. I'm not really reading the news too much because I hate it as it is. So, um, come Friday morning, okay, it's Friday morning, come Friday morning, things get very scary, people. Things get very ugly. Okay, this is when true military force comes into Watertown. I cannot, I cannot count the amount of police. I think they were in the thousands, uh, like around 7,000 that were actually in Watertown or Boston area. But they had pseudo tanks. That's what I like to call them, like you see in the picture. Right, right, uh, yeah. We're right, showing the them right now, actually, yeah. Yeah, the guy there, he's a, uh, they have SWAT gunners. They also have the, the other guy who doesn't even wear a helmet. Um, every, okay, I, before I become a mess here, let me try and be more calculated. Uh, the morning of Friday, you've heard everything about martial law. You know what happened. Okay, but the significance of my experience was, uh, first of all, I think they tapped everyone's lines because, and I, I, well, it's a crime scene. Everyone is suspect. It's a large crime scene. They tapped phone lines. I think they tapped internet. Also, Boston Globe gave us a call that morning, which was very terrifying because that's when there was a huge stakeout of dozens and dozens of federal officers around our house. Before, before what was about to come, which I'll explain soon, um, and I think that that was a preemptive strike, that they were working in conjunct or they were the police to try and identify who was in our house pretending to be Boston Globe. Uh, because allegedly they were looking for hostages or they were looking for people who are withholding the terrorists in some shape or form. Um, so shortly after that, we were looking through our blinds. We're looking through our blinds. And you also see an update from the police on their Twitter uh, that I, that uh, uh, people are looking through their curtains and they're acting like it's a very suspicious activity. I'm sorry, I'm terrified of this Nazi Germany police state. Let me look through my blind. I'm sorry. We'll bleep okay. that, don't worry. Go ahead. All right, all right. Okay, shortly after that, uh, there was, I, you know they're coming to your house, okay? And what happened next was the worst of it. They, um, they, they came to my back door, they're knocking on it saying, come out, come out now, get out here right now, get out here now. And I'm thinking, is, is this my last day? Am I going to die? Am I going to be somehow dragged into this under false pretenses? I don't know. So um, I begin to slowly draw open the door with hands up in this manner saying, please, I, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm here, I'm coming out, I'm coming out. And it's like at any given moment, they could have shot me because even though I was being so-called compliant, which, you know, I just had to be from what it seemed reluctantly. Um, but anyway, I, I step outside. I'm staring at more than a dozen, and I think it was around 15 officers, military style, with assault rifles, M16s, aimed at my face. And I just said, I'm scared, guys. I'm scared. And right away, I, the, I, after I said, I'm scared, I said, come inside, you know, like shivering. And they said, clear, clear. So anyway, that, that was the, the worst of Friday morning. And so uh, they left far. at that point or did they come into your house? That was the initial, I'm going to say so-called clearance because they were, they were doing a total militarized, like the terrorists are going to kill us in any house. I honestly feel that my street was under the, the hottest tension at that time. Uh, people, the, the, the amount of guns aimed at people was just crazy. I don't know if they were the most paranoid at that moment around 9 a.m., but yeah, I'm starting to kind of lose track of what I'm saying here. Hopefully you can keep me uh, aligned. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I understand where you're going with, and you even interviewed one of your neighbors as well, and it was a neighbor that we interviewed, and she basically said the same story both times. Correct. Um, Loretta, yes. Yeah. So, so anyway, go ahead. So they've, so they've left at this point, right, the first time they've come to your house. Yes, the initial sweep is over, and uh, it's basically a terror all day, making you completely sick to your stomach, like, I can't live. If I would have had to put up with this for longer than 24 hours, I would have had serious health problems. Uh, I would have really started, my body would have started degrading severely because of the, the stress that it was putting upon me. I couldn't sleep. 
it was it was literally Nazi Germany, okay? And I actually, I did have a, a friend who I can't name uh, who was assaulted by police, and he was detained. Uh, he's my neighbor. And what was he doing? Was he out of his house? What was he doing? He he had he uh, he's severely addicted to cigarettes, and he, he had to go have a smoke. And he had no nicotine patches, and he had to go outside. And when he did, the the milita militarized police. Uh, I, they profiled him racially as well, because uh, he looks similar to the suspect. Oh, was he and Indian? They, was he Indian? He uh, he is not Indian. Okay. No, but um, he comes from the same country that they do come from. Okay. By citizenship. Right. And um, I thought I'm, maybe they were pulling up people's information too. But I mean, I'm just extrapolating. That's. Sure. I'm probably getting too paranoid, but maybe not. But they detained him in any case for going out and having a cigarette. They assaulted him first. They actually right. punched him at least one time in the ribs, and uh, then they detained him. And he said to me, look, my friend, they weren't detaining me for any good reason. They know I didn't do anything. And I said, so why did they do it? And he goes, brute force, in intimidation, power, yeah. uh, a show of force. Right. And he said, this is all a coup. That was his great insinuation there. Nothing's really happening, my friend. So he knew that this was an inside job. Okay. Well, keep going. So uh, they come okay. back to your place at some point. What happened then? Correct. After uh, somewhat at midday, uh, the pseudo tank rolls by, and then a large Humvee um, and SWAT, uh, the, a large SWAT team comes into my house. And I'll be honest, I do not even remember if they asked if they could come in or not. But let me make a point here. Prior to them coming into my house, I heard them outside because my windows are not very thick. And they were saying something along the lines of, says it was staged on Facebook. And oh, so I, you heard that? You heard that? I heard that, correct. Okay. And, and had you been saying that on Facebook, that it had been staged? Yes, I did, Rob. Ah. Yes, I did. So you think, well, you know, we do have reports that, that DHS is monitoring Facebook and Twitter in real time. Yes, I know. I know, Rob. Wow. Okay, we'll continue. So, so as you can imagine at this point, uh, this is obviously very humiliating. I thought because of my beliefs, I was in deep trouble, uh, which is why I've been actually probably really reluctant. And ironically that I'm being interviewed now to talk about this, but I feel that there is a safety net uh, to come forth and talk uh, about this here. Well, obviously. it's better to talk about it. And, and let, me, let me make another point. Your Facebook is actually set to private. So if Correct. they were... Looking right. at your Facebook, there is no privacy when you set it to private when it comes to DHS. I couldn't agree more. So it more. would seem. And, I, and that was what I had learned from this, is that there is no privacy uh, yeah. on Facebook, at least, whatsoever. All right, so they're coming in this time. And how many officers? Uh, there was at least a dozen uh, okay. SWAT team. There, it was an isolated team, as if they had been uh, separated and told to go to different areas within Watertown. Uh, so this was one isolated SWAT team. Um, these guys did not want to do this. Uh, they seemed like they didn't care anymore. Regardless, they did ask. I think they asked to raid my house. I'm sorry that I can't remember, honestly. Yeah. But I wasn't even going to hesitate because what I heard them saying outside, I just thought, let them in. I will not let myself uh, even be any more of a pain in this situation because this is way too hot. This is way too hot, and I'm just going to – See what happens. Did they so, tell you to put your hands up when you came out? These guys did the not do that, actually. Okay. They did not. Um, they were probably the most polite officers about the whole thing. They, so and I, I do want to make a slight point of that. I, I think they might have been Boston SWAT or Watertown SWAT. Um, Instead of outside uh, forces coming in. They did not appear to be federal. Okay. So, yeah. Um, anyway, they asked my wife and I to come outside. I had no shoes on. We brought our dog because we could not let our dog pee all day. Yeah. Because every time we did, we'd have guns aimed at us or the threat of frisking. You know, I saw people, little girls being harassed, little girls, because they're trying to go outside. But I think that we kind of already know that that's gone on quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So they uh, corralled us. Me and my neighbors, because they took a lot of us out at once, they wanted to check our houses. Um, they asked me if they could go in the basement. I said yes, and I also indicated that my neighbor did have a key. Um, 
So they took us and we went on a, a walk. <laughs> so they took uh, you away from your house at that point? They took me away from my house. And I actually had a conversation with the, the SWAT officer and he was very apologetic. He was very apologetic, which I thought was curious to me personally. So I, I decided to ask him a few questions and I said, so it must be really troubling, you know, not having a lead, any solid lead about what's going on, right? I mean, he didn't say anything naturally. And I said, well, I think I said something else. Try to try to try to get some information out of him to no avail. But he seemed it seemed as though some of the local law enforcement was a little confused. And I just want I want to say that. Oh, I, I believe you. Yeah. Uh, when I was at the G20 in uh, Pittsburgh in 2009, there was a dramatic difference between how the local police acted, and you could tell by their accents because Pittsburgh has a very distinct accent, Pittsburghers do, and they brought in uh, SWAT and other uh, police from Miami, from all over the country, and the ones that were not from the hometown acted a lot more aggressive than the ones who were from the hometown. It, it, and I could, I could see why. It's a, you know, these are my neighbors. I might know some of these people is probably what's going through their minds. But go ahead and continue. Okay, so these guys, the SWAT team, were polite enough. And uh, they essentially held us out for a time, uh, of which I still hesitantly felt like they were suspicious of me, possibly in connection to what I had uh, said earlier. So I, I was kind of on guard a bit, but then they eventually said, you're, the FBI drove by me and a woman said, you're clear, you're clear. So I thought, okay, well, this is fascinatingly great. Uh, so we got to go back to our houses and that was a relief, but uh, we were still under martial law at this time. Right. Uh, correctly and, so. And how did you, what, what, what word did you get when, when you weren't under martial law, which MSNBC says never happened? I'm sorry, can you explain that? When did you get the word that, that you were no longer in martial law or that no longer okay. in lockdown? I think the, the term that the governor used was shelter in place, euphemism for martial law. But anyway, when, when did you get that word and how did you receive it? I think that, well, I think they were saying that this was a voluntary uh, lockdown was what they wanted to say afterwards. Right, of course, it yeah, yeah. It, but obviously it wasn't. And um, they, no one told me that I, I could go back outside. Uh, I was just looking outside, and it, see, things seemed really clear, and it seemed really uh, like it had calmed down a lot, and I wanted to go outside. No one told me anything. I called Watertown Police Department, and I said, uh, am I allowed to go back outside? Oh, that's ridiculous. And, you had to call the correct. cops to go outside? I mean... Isn't that humiliating? Yes. Good God. Right. Yeah, so-called free country. And so since then, you've, you're obviously distressed. You're still stressed out about this, I can tell. Um, uh, you know, what, what do you think when you, when you see these other news outlets, these mainstream media outlets saying, there was nothing wrong, we had to do this, you know, trying to make excuses for the police, you know, basically brutalizing and terrorizing the citizens? I've been doing this for so long, uh, telling the truth. Uh, um, and I've really... I've, been quite an avid fan of InfoWars for many years. Um, I really don't, I am not surprised, but I'm extremely disappointed. So there's not much for me to say, you know, because I understand the level of deceit and why people don't get it and why the mainstream media is on a certain payroll, just like the feds were. Right. So. Well, and you were telling me earlier, right before we started this interview, that you wish um, you know, more people would come out and speak out. Why don't, you know, here's your chance to talk to these people right now, look straight into your yeah. camera and, and, you know, tell them what you feel. Specifically my neighbors, right? Yeah. That's, I, I think that, that I, well, first of all, there was a guy who made a video about this, about martial law. And I, and I think maybe I, I, well, I tried to get a hold of him and he didn't want to, he didn't want to talk about this. I think that's the, the feeling I got. I think that the level of fear that's been created here in Boston specifically is, uh, and the massive police influence that's been created is probably one of the greatest uh, demonstrations of uh, intimidation to create fear that there ever was. So if there are people like myself who have come out and said things about this, I do think that probably they should try and say things themselves. I mean, there's not much to it other than the fact that if you do, uh, you're doing the right thing, you know, so.
Yeah, I think it's important that people speak out about this because it's going to happen again, and people need to be aware. You know, a lot of people were smart. They got their cameras out. They started shooting video of this, throwing it up on YouTube. And I think that made a big difference in showing the world what was going on. And this was for one 19-year-old boy. I mean, imagine what would happen if it was two people that were on the loose or three people. You know, it, it, it just seems they want any excuse they can to just ratchet up the police state and make us think like it's for our safety. And in the end, who found him? A guy going out for a cigarette went out to his boat and saw it. And then they shot up the boat, and then they, you know, take this guy out and give him a tracheotomy, cut his throat up, so now he can't talk. I mean, this is just bizarro world, what was going on in Boston. But I've, I've experienced it firsthand. I've seen 1,500 riot cops show up for a protest of, of 50 people. And it was a peaceful protest, and it was <laughs> on police brutality. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, it doesn't end, and it's never going to end until we just stand up and start getting in, I think we, we got to get in their faces. We got to, you know, go out and talk to the police chief. Why did you let these people come in? Talk to the sheriff. Why did you let the feds come in and treat us like this? You know, because mm -hmm. they're not going to stop. Their tactics are to stomp and destroy. Yeah. Do you have anything Please. else? Do you have anything else you want to add? As, as, fr as Friday continued, when I asked if I can go back outside, uh, I did. And there was still Watertown police on my street. Okay. A, a very normal, macho, funny, a-hole cop, you know, but he's small town. Okay. He was just sitting on the corner and uh, cracking jokes with my neighbor. Um, so we're, we're, we're allowed to go back outside, but there's a great feeling of tension. Okay. And shortly after this, probably within five or 10 minutes after I, got the okay to go out uh you heard gunfire again and this is the so-called boat incident mm -hmm. and uh it took this cop these cops these watertown pd uh, this is the, the face they made they they look so confused for five to ten seconds just lost like is this really happening they didn't know what was going on until bam get back in your houses Okay, wow. so I mean, I just wanted to point that out. They yeah. did not understand what was going on. And then they yell at you to get back in your house. And As it's all for your safety. Would say, yeah. They just tell you it's all for your safety over and over again. Courage, it just takes a little bit of courage to really just go, hey, you know, this isn't right. What I witnessed, you know, and telling people what you witnessed because the mainstream media is out there telling the rest of the world that nothing happened. Everything was fine. You know, we have to do this for your safety. We have to treat you like prisoners in your town. And I noticed that he was wearing orange there. He almost looked like a prisoner. And the way he was acting, I could tell he was, you know, Greg has been deeply affected by this. I mean, you know, having 16 people aiming uh, semi-automatic rifles. I mean, how, how do you think that would make you feel if you're in your house? You know, he had his hands up going out the door. He was afraid to get shot in his own house.